Now we have one of the highlights of, I mean, I, I think every aspect of this program is, is, is just wonderful, full of highlights. We're going to have a discussion of free market capitalism in an age of anti-globalism. This is a fascinating, it, it, it really deals with the tensions of the time. And, and it's wonderful to uh, uh, have a platform here today to discuss, and you'll get a chance to ask questions. I'm going to run around the room, so get some good questions, and please you know, make them, you know, sharp, succinct questions. But, but, but please welcome to the stage John Lettieri, co-founder and senior director for policy and strategy of the Economic Innovation Group, and Lawrence Kudlow, who's senior contributor for CNBC, one of the most interesting economic uh, commentators in the nation today. I'm an avid fan of his Twitter feed, uh, in which completely unrelated to EIG, his last tweet was telling the uh, Congress to confirm Kevin Hassett, who happened to be co the co-chair of EIG. There's no connection at all to his appearing here and his celebration of Kevin Hassett. But with no idea, please, please welcome to the stage Lawrence Kudlow. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Kevin. Okay, uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? So far, so good. That's a low energy answer. Come on, guys. Come on. How's everybody doing? All right, so we're very excited about this. Uh, Larry really needs no introduction, but uh, as a syndicated columnist, a syndicated radio show host, an author, head of an economic analysis firm, uh, he keeps busy, so we're glad we have him here today. Uh, Larry wanted me to stress that he is speaking just for himself, but with a wink that we all know that this is an informed opinion about what the administration is thinking and doing, and with a lot of great insight on where things like tax reform are going, so I look forward to getting into all that. So I'm just going to jump right in. Larry, we, we've talked, we have a broad conversation here today about the economy and our kind of fundamental strengths and weaknesses, challenges, policy priorities. We hear a lot of doom and gloom about where the economy is going. Robots are taking our jobs. Disruption is on the horizon. As somebody who has spent his entire career thinking about the economy, studying markets, what are you most optimistic about today about the U.S. economy? What are our greatest opportunities and advantages? Well, look, I think the single most important issue domestically is to rebuild a broad-based, durable, deep-rooted prosperity, which we have not had in many years, under Republicans and Democrats, frankly. And I think that's what the election was all about. Apart from national security, that's what the election was all about. I think that's still paramount. So. Uh, I am an optimist as a rule, and I think you're going to see the opportunity for a lot of policy reforms. Perhaps we'll get into that. Tax reform, budget reform, regulatory reform, uh, monetary reform. And to, to quote my friend John Taylor at Stanford, um, you know, take the muzzle off the economy and that let it grow. And I think that's essentially what President Trump is going to try to do. So drive prosperity. You know, look at prosperity. How does this impact the economy? That should be asked of every single, every single policy. This, how does this impact the economy? So I want to unpack that a little bit because one of the hallmarks of this recovery period has been a narrow swath of people, places, companies, relatively disproportionate to what we've seen in previous uh, recoveries where there was broader base growth and there was broader base prosperity. So we're in an expansion period where no sign of downturn on the horizon, GDP growth has been okay, not great, but people locally are not feeling that in many places the way they once did. So when you talk about prosperity, I, I think the question would be what new policy levers or different policy levers do we need this time? And why does, I, mean, I guess make the case for us that the left behind communities that Trump has embraced, that he campaigned on, that he has made a big part of his messaging and his base. How are they going to see a benefit from something like corporate tax reform as you see it well, coming down the pipeline? Well, you know, on that specific item, uh, Kevin Hassett is really the, the godfather to a large extent. I mean, he's not, the only, he's not the first guy to talk about corporate tax reform, but the work that Kevin has done going back about 10 years, which originally was very controversial, but now there's a lot of literature supporting that. There's also literature uh, disagreeing. But his argument has been for quite some time um, the biggest beneficiary of lower corporate taxes would be the wage earners, the middle and lower middle income classes. And he puts that benefit at about 70 percent. 
Um, others who have looked at this in the wake of Kevin's early work put it even higher. So we, I've always had that same assumption, just instinctively. And then there's, you know, this wonderful economist in Washington named Kevin Hassett, who, you know, really gave us the proofs. And I think that it's my great hope that the administration will utilize that uh, argument because I, I think business tax cuts uh, and reform. I'm okay, I'm fine with reform, but I want it's the three three easy pieces. That's what we're arguing. Um, uh, lower corporate tax rate. Uh, immediate uh, expensing of new equipment and repatriation. Three easy pieces. And I, I think in terms of your question, I think what's been missing in this whole recovery, um, and I think we saw glimpses of that during the Bush years, is a real decline in business investment and capital formation. And the numbers prove that out. Um, what's happened in the last 15 years is way below that whole, let's say, 1950 to 2000 marker that John Cochran and others have used. I've used it. So now that is not, I don't expect to roll back the clock on manufacturing jobs. But because our capital stock has not risen, it's, oh, it's only risen about a, a quarter of, the, of its historical pace. Um, that has prevented the normal recovery of business investment. Now, consumers have recovered, by and large. The financial world has recovered, by and large. Um, it's the business side. And I think that... Now, wait a minute. Business profits are at an all-time high as share of GDP. The stock market's at an all-time high. So some people would look at that and say, why do we need tax reform? Why do we need corporate reform? What problem is that? Well, solving? don't don't mistake the stock market for a business sure, investment. Fair. I'm just, this That's is an argument that people make. So they're, they're two separate. What problem are we solving? Two on the separate side? Well, I mean, ultimately, the tax reform will be, I think, enhance profits. Um, you know, one re profits. I'm sorry. Stocks have gone up in large measure because profits have rebounded, and um, in some measure because of the Fed's uh, ultra easy money. And I don't think it's only the top 1%. I, I'd be happy to come back to that. But I'm not talking about markets so much as I'm talking about just companies who have the cash, who didn't stash it overseas, which is where some of those, a good chunk of those profits have gone. But the companies who have the cash are not indicating a normal uh, planning period where they're willing to take the risks of building a seven to ten or longer um, planning program, investment planning program. And that's why we're not rebuilding our capital stock fast enough. And the slump in productivity, in my judgment, comes directly from those failures. Directly. I mean, the capital stock and business uh, investment and things like productivity, the K over L ratio, the drop in new business startups which has been breathtaking, unfortunately. You know, in the 80s and 90s, I was arguing all the time, I was in the government for a while, but on the air, um, Schumpeter's gales of creative destruction were working beautifully, beautifully. And there's always some short-term pain, maybe we'll get to that. But unfortunately, that has not been the case. And there are a lot of obstacles to rebuilding that kind of confidence, what some people call animal spirits, or whatever sure. you wish to call it. So. But the reason I'm an optimist on this whole picture is that I think the president is going directly with these policies. That's what I think. So I've been struck in talking to you both today and, and uh, recently about your level of optimism, because you're in a relatively small club of uh, Republicans who are not freaking out about the Trump administration uh, and some <laughs> of the messaging and mixed messaging that we're hearing. Uh, and yet there are some clear areas where you just, and the theme of this panel is ostensibly free market capitalism in the age of anti-globalization. So talk about an issue like trade, where you are a lifelong free trade advocate. You believe strongly in the power of free trade to lift markets, lift prosperity. That's, that's not the messaging, I'll put it lightly, that we hear from the, from the White House, from the president. So why are you so optimistic? Well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't obsess about trade, okay? I mean, for one thing, the president's 
actual movement on trade has been much, much milder than many people feared. And I'm just going to put, the, I mean, if you want to talk direct trade, we can later, but I'm just saying that the other components of his plan, which I had a hand in during the campaign, the business tax reform, the regulatory reform, the budget reform, which is fixing the small entitlement programs to create incentives to work rather than not work. Um, even on infrastructure, which I think has to be reformed, you can see in recent days the president's pronouncements, you know, he wants a substantial majority influence coming from the private sector, not the government sector. And I think that's exactly right, precisely right. And of late, he has said the air traffic controllers, um, that should be a private operation. And indeed, I think the whole airport system, believe it or not, in LaGuardia in New York, it's all being done privately. The reconstruction of that horrible place and the actual management of that's going to be done privately, okay? How about that? So Trump is, is you know, he believes that stuff as a businessman. He believes that and he's going to go through with it. And he's got a lot of good people in the cabinet to, to move that ball. So you, I want to get back to tax reform specifically. You have maybe one of the best perspectives on what exactly is the current thinking on what tax reform should be. Revenue neutral, not revenue neutral, corporate only, not corporate only. You, you wrote, co-authored an op-ed that is said to have been really influential on the president's thinking about tax reform back in April, which I think was entitled, Why Are Republicans Making This So Hard? Uh, which kind of implied a sense of let's not screw this up uh, and keep it simple. What, do you think the president's moving in that direction in terms of how things are shaping up internally? And what, I won't ask you to handicap it the way the last panel did, but uh, you remain optimistic that something significant will be done mm -hmm. this year? And what will yeah, that look like? I think there's a good shot at it before year end. Well, along guess, the lines of corporate only, not, not deficit neutral? Well, that, well that's it. Wait, corporate, you're asking two very big, uh, different questions. But these are the things that you had laid out in the op-ed. So I guess I'm asking you, do you think the administration is moving closer towards Larry Kudlow and Stephen Moore on, on this, or? I think we're winning. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's just my view. That's, well, I don't want to go any further than that, but I, I have reason to believe our position is winning. But you're not tired of winning yet. I'm not what? You're not tired of winning yet. <laughs> Listen, uh, that was a Trump joke, I'm sorry. I don't want to even begin to tell you <laughs> the batting average we had with our proposals during the campaign. It was uh, not as near as high as it should have been. But this business about revenue neutral versus tax reform, I, I don't know that I understand this at all. Uh, they're not mutually <laughs> exclusive. Now, I will take the position, in which many people in the profession disagree, I understand that, but I will take the view that the corporate tax reform, uh, lower the rate, uh, expensing of new investment, and bringing the overseas cash home, uh, will uh, absolutely pay for itself, um, not immediately, but you know, give it three, four years thereabouts. Give it three, four years. That's been the experience with many other countries around the world. Lower corporate rates, behavior is very sensitive to that. And that includes not only the new incentives, but that includes changing behavior with respect to tax shelters and um, inversions and all the rest of it. It's highly inefficient. And you got a 35% or 40% tax rate, uh, federal and state, and yields <laughs> very low uh, revenues compared to the economy. I don't know what it is, 2.5%. So that should tell you something is a flaw. Now, I think that is really going to inject a growth booster. And I think you will get these longer term investment projects. And I think those will create opportunities uh, for major changes in the jobs, in the workforce. And I know people will be left behind. And I'm a strong advocate of things like uh, tech training, um, community colleges, uh, trade schools. Um, we've overlooked that. And we need to go back to that because Anytime you have big changes and transformations, as we have had in other technology booms, you know, going back to the turn of the last century. Uh, so yeah, if, to the extent, I, I don't want that done federally, by the way. I mean, we have whatever we have, 49 or 50 federal training programs, none of them work. 
I who's, want it done. job should that be? The private sector or state and local government? Um, a combination, okay? Um, we're doing some of that. Uh, I have a home in Connecticut. Um, I vote in Connecticut, and then I live in New York during the week. But there's a lot of movement towards going to the business people in Connecticut, those who haven't already left, and saying to them, okay, what would you like us to do? What is your need for labor? What's the skill set? What are you looking for? And then go and retrain. All right? And as I say, that can be done with community colleges. That can be done with trade schools, uh, tech schools. You know, you, fixing things is a lost art. Now, you may be off the assembly line, but a lot of those folks can fix things. They may have some retraining. So the business can do it and the schools can do it. I don't want the federal government to do it because every place is a different story. And I think that's been a mistake up to now. So I, I'm optimistic about that. There's no way. Trump, by the way, is very strongly in favor of that sort of thing. And the other point I want to make in this you know, large economic belt on Shung we're talking about is uh, the rollback of regulations. Uh, I think we have had a tremendous boom, unfortunately, in regulatory obstacles uh, for both existing businesses and new businesses. Um, I don't frankly think that affects big business near as much as it does small business. It's one of the reasons why we insisted during the campaign um, that the tax rate reform uh, be available to the pass-throughs, which is a huge chunk of American business. And there are ways and means to get, to get that done. So I think the regulatory thing is just, you know, we had a period in the 80s and 90s where by and large regulations were brought down. Um, you know, Reagan, Reagan, Papa Bush, Clinton, Clinton, um, they all were one way or another basically pro-business. I mean, we could get into that granular history, but that's my point of view on it. And uh, we lost that in the 2000s, and we lost that in the Obama years, but the, the, the losses started during the Bush years. I mean, Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, a lot of going overboard. Anyhow, regulatory issues on energy have been very damaging. Uh, regulatory issues, I think, financially, in the financial world, particularly the smaller banks, have been very damaging. Regulations on health care. Uh, I'm an opponent of Obamacare, and I think that was a perfect case of top-heavy regulations that mucked up the system. So Trump is an advocate of that. He's an advocate of that. Now, maybe to conclude your question, and there are other things. I'm not trying to get every single point in. We can do that in the Q&A if we want. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's a lot of never-Trumpers uh, and some of them are my conservative brothers and sisters. I understand that. Um, but I would say to them, if you just look at his policies, he is the most conservative president since Reagan. That is fast becoming my view. And but what if you look at his he, Twitter account? He will come, you see. Because but I, but I want to, this is germane because I, I want to get into the Wall Street Journal, which has been a friend uh, of, of the administration. No. Has a uh, pretty scalding no, uh, editorial way, today. With all fairness to Paul Jago and company, they've been uh, not a big friend. Well, as far as fake news goes, very we're critical. just talking, you know. I mean, there's a, it's a supply side editorial page. God bless them. But um, they don't lay down for Mr. Trump. Nevertheless, the editorial page uh, ran a, a piece today saying that essentially Trump has become his own worst enemy for, his, uh, for passing his agenda, which is something you hear privately from a lot of Republicans, a lot of people who would otherwise be inclined to support uh, the agenda that you're talking about. Uh, and we're seeing this play out in real time over the last 24 hours, the president attacking the mayor of London, et cetera, talking about his travel ban as a travel ban, which is a direct contradiction of the messaging. The reason I raise this is because we know how hard something like tax reform is, even when you have all the pieces aligned. You need presidential leadership, you need coherence. Do you, do you agree that this is, uh, the, the administration is its own worst enemy, the president has become uh, a problem for his passing his own agenda? And talk about Twitter, because that, that's something in terms of the messaging part, that you have, you have to get tax reform messaging right. Even on this stage, among people who are very smart, there's been a lot of confusion as to what the White House actually wants to do on tax reform. And that can't last if we hope to 
uh, see that, that policy move forward. So what would be your candid advice here publicly on stage? Stay the, the course. President? Stay the Twitter course? No, stay the policy course. But I does there come a point where you worry that the messaging gets in the way of the substance? Sometimes. You know, presidents get it out right sometimes and sometimes they don't. I think there's vastly, vastly too much attention paid. Sometimes the president is um, sending messages through Twitter to the greater population that the Beltway media miss. Um, and sometimes he probably does some damage uh, when he's off message. But, but on the whole, I think far too much attention is being paid to this. What, see, my, my statement that he's the most conservative president we've had since Reagan um, and may prove to be as conservative as Reagan. Reagan was a populist, Trump is a populist, um, is a policy analysis. It's a policy analysis. And um, I personally would like to see him go out and rally his troops in different spots around the country for tax cuts and reform. There's only, you know, my experience with these things, and I sure saw it with Reagan in his first term, I was a economics deputy in OMB, uh, Reagan was very carefully scheduled to get around the country, you know, not a thousand appearances, but a lot, and, and drum up support for his tax cut plan, which was the single biggest domestic initiative of the first term, mm -hmm. and, and defense being the other one. But Reagan also delivered several Oval Office TV talks to the country, prime time stuff, everybody covered it. Uh, we actually had him doing charts, facts and figures. We actually had you know, two line charts and this one's this and that one. It was great, it was terrific. And it was so effective and then he'd say, you know, call your congressman and tell him what you think. And the White House switchboard would be overloaded and all the Congress switch lines would be overloaded. So people were very into it, they dialed into it, they watched. I mean, this is their money. It's their take-home pay, as the Gipper used to call it. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to see President Trump do that because I think when he does, he's extremely effective. He's a very good communicator. Um, and I think there's much more being a very good communicator than not. I think people spend too much time on the Twitter. Look, I like to do Twitter. Um, I think the president has about 25 million accounts, something like that. 31. I don't quite have that many followers yet. Um, so I get twelve million something, of them something fake. to aspire to. I know we want to take some questions from the audience, Steve. Yeah, I've got some. Just real quick, Jared Bernstein, who's one of your great friends and intellectual soulmates, wanted to pose a question. He said you were a great OMB Reagan guy, and so he's perplexed by your enthusiasm for the Trump budget. If in fact, as analysts on left and right said, he's uh, double counting two trillion dollars of growth effects in there, and he's just wondering where you are on the double. I counting just don't understand it. Somebody's going to have to walk me through this double counting argument. I don't really understand that at all. Um, but if a, there is double counting, then you wouldn't the, support the budget? There's a growth impact, and then there's a revenue, uh, I'll call it tax reform impact. And there's, it's probably part of the reforms, part of the rate reduction, where people uh, stop sheltering all the income. So if you remove the loopholes, so-called, um, you'll see a lot of revenues come in. It'll be, you know, done, to, and that's a growth impact. So I don't understand that, but you had another point. So you're point. for it until you're against it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay, cool. Look, there we I, go. The Mulvaney <laughs> budget, I mean, I haven't gone through it line by line, but the large points in Mick Mulvaney's budget, which I wrote a column on and called it a growth budget, um, not only the tax uh, cut proposals are in there, but in many ways, the, the Trump administration is saying, and I would market this, that they are gonna rebuild the Bill Clinton welfare reforms, the so-called small entitlements. Uh, food stamps, disability, welfare, they all have new names now. Um, uh, and I think that would be a huge plus because I think, unfortunately, under the last two administrations, and particularly the current, or the most recent, but both administrations unraveled 
the Clinton welfare reform. And I've always given President Clinton enormous credit for that. Uh, you know, Democrats can do good, in my opinion. They can do very good. That's the point of my book, JFK and the Reagan Revolution. I had to get that in because I don't think, did you mention it? I was going to bring it back. You might have. Great. I just wanted you to get that. It's available. <laughs> we'll get the Amazon on, link out On books. Amazon and any you other You get bookstore. used copies for two or three cents. But the point is, <laughs> no, yeah. no, 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 I mean, it did. John F. Kennedy, the Democrat, right, the Democrat, turned his back on the New Deal and went for lower tax rise advised by a Republican, Doug Dillon. And 20 some odd years later, Reagan did the exact same thing. Reagan at that point obviously was a Republican, but he also was a New Deal liberal for most of his political career up to that point. And so I, neither party, in my view, has a monopoly on, on pro-growth ideas. I'll just leave that as a sort of That's dangling. Great. Let's uh, get one more question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Terry Bergman with the National Association of Workforce Boards. Of which? Workforce Boards. Workforce, Workforce Boards. Oh. And first, I would argue that the evaluations of workforce development programs have shown that they are effective, whereas you've just said they all failed. Second thing is the federal government's workforce development programs send the money to the state and local level for them to run programs that make sense, pay for the programs you're talking about of, of um, community colleges. So if you're saying the programming should happen at the state and local level, that is what the federal government's workforce programs accomplish. The budget, the budget that is there a Trump, question? yes, is there the a budget question? that Trump put out cuts those programs by 40%. My question is, how are we going to pay for the development programs that you say we need to do if we're cutting all the funding for them? Well, I, I just a few points. Um, I mean, you have a strong bias in this, and I think we're going to disagree. We're going to disagree on our biases. Um, I don't think the federal government. Uh, should even be in that business, all right? And I don't think there's any need to layer federal money down. You want local stuff? Go to local stuff. You can make a transition. Go to local stuff. Local people know more. And um, I think there's a very substantial consensus that the federal work programs, and there's a lot of them, almost 50 of them, uh, have not done what we wanted them to do. And the answer is always, let's have a new federal work program. On the other hand, I think the state and locals, and counties and so forth, um, have and will continue to have a much better, um, a much better uh, chance of getting this done. And I will also just add, um, uh, this group is a sophisticated group, so you understand the current services baseline, which always goes up on average by 7% a year um, in recent decades. and so. If you come in at 5% or 4% growth, that's a cut. It's not a cut. It's not a reduction in the level at all. It's a reduction in the growth rate. And I think people should understand that. I, I have a sense this group uh, may. Um, and the other thing is something Mick Mulvaney said the day he unveiled the budget, which, with which I totally agree. Uh, the, the measure of success should never be the amount of federal dollars thrown at programs. More does not mean better, and often more means worse. The point that Mr. Mulvaney is making, and one which, with which I completely agree, is that more people leaving federal assistance, I'm going to call it generically welfare, and moving into work and workfare is the ultimate goal of what this budget wants to do. And I want, uh, I may have an opportunity to do this or I may not, but uh, when I next speak with the president, um, I'm going to suggest that he call President Clinton and say to him, you know, we're really borrowing your ideas. And this gets me back to Kennedy, or Reagan borrowing Kennedy's idea of tax cuts. And that perhaps President Clinton would be interested not only in policy input, 
but he might help the market. Just that, I know it's not going to be a crossover entirely. Because these, these are an effort, attempt to rebuild the Clinton reforms, which in my opinion worked, did get people from welfare to work for, workforce, and contributed mightily to economic growth and to a greater self-esteem for the entire country. You know, my pal Arthur Brooks from the American Enterprise Institute, runs the AEI, has for years done these wonderful studies uh, regarding happiness. Happiness, okay? Um, and he argues through his data that people who have uh, a job in the, in the private workforce are happier than people who depend on assistance from the government. Now, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a, let me clarify. I believe in the social safety net. I'm not suggesting that. But I think uh, this point about getting them away from government assistance and towards working is a good point. Larry, get the name of the book again, JFK. And the Reagan Revolution. I just wanted to get that last point. I want to thank both of you, John Letieri, great. great conversation. Lawrence Kudlow, thank you so much for joining us. I want to really sp say thanks to, to Larry because he flew down from New York specifically for this conversation. I know how busy you are, so thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I'm staying